Rick Hahn is the executive vice president. He's the general manager. He's the architect of what's going on on the South Side, a team that had a very good year but fell short of their goals. And now they're going to roll into the 22 season as one of the picks that can win the World Series. So how do you take that next step? Rick Hahn joins us now. Rick, good morning. How are you, buddy? Uh, doing well, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you for taking time. You know we always love talking baseball with you. What is the number one thing in the offseason, knowing that you've got a really good team coming back that you feel like we got to be better at that? Boy, I think any team that has legitimate World Series aspirations is always going to look to solidify the pitching staff. Now, don't get me wrong. We obviously had a had a real good year. I think overall our our pitchers actually led all of the majors in wins above replacement over the 21 season. But over the course of any any year, much less one like 21, where you have a huge innings jump from 20 to 21, guys can run out of gas. And we certainly saw in the postseason, at least for those four days against Houston, uh, that having some more pitching reinforcements would do as well. Uh, as we sit here right now, and we know that Ryan Tepera is a free agent, Michael Kopech's projected to go into the rotation. Obviously, the bullpen is going to be priority, but we're going to continue to look around it anyway to, to strengthen that pitching staff, just like any other contender. Rick, last year and uh, the year before that, uh, first round and out in the playoffs, how would you uh, look at this past season? How would you characterize what you saw? You know, it, it, I'm glad we're talking whatever it is, about a month after the postseason ended for us, because immediately when you when you have those – at least three disappointing days uh, where we lost to Houston in the first round. You, you know, it, it stings. It stings. And you realize that you didn't accomplish your ultimate goals and that it's no real way at that point to look at the season other than as a disappointment. At the same time, having a little bit of space between now and then, you're able to take a, a step back and realize that, you know, we, we are in the middle of a window. We do have a credible championship team right now obviously there's ways we got to improve those were evident not just over the you know 34 and a half innings or however many we played against houston in the in the playoffs but they were evident over the course of the summer last year so like i said reinforcing the pitching you know seeing ways that we could potentially improve our, our defense and base running uh being able to better control the running game on defense uh, those are all elements that showed themselves in October and are areas that hopefully we're going to be able to improve upon to further increase those World Series chances in 22. You mentioned pitching, and I have been on, you know, I'm not shy of sharing my opinions. I, <laughs> I was talking to someone from Atlanta, and they said, we had the money to sign one free agent, and it was Barry Bonds or Greg Maddox. And most in the front office went, well, we've already got Glavin, Smoltz, Avery, Lee Brandt, we're good. And they said, no, you know what? Let's sign Greg Maddox. And that's the way they went. And then they won, I don't know, a billion divisions in a row. <laughs> Could you see a scenario where if the right guy's there and he's interested, yeah, I'd sign a number one starter? It's certainly a possibility. Look, it'd be foolish for us to turn ourselves away from any viable number one starter type. And, and I think you're, and if teams are being totally transparent with you, Cap. I think everyone would say they want to secure that type. That's sort of the holy grail. Uh, certainly, you look back at our rotation this year, and we had multiple guys, whether it was uh, Carlos early in the season or, or Lance at, at, for long stretches and Giolito during stretches, that pitched like number ones. And you go back to that 05 team. You know, for Hartman back to Maddox, I can Harten back to the 05 team as well. And that team probably had five number twos who on any given day, a Contreras or even a Burley could pitch like a number one. So having pitching depth, quality options throughout the rotation is important. But, you know, that number one, there aren't two, there are not 30 of them. Even though there's 30 guys who start on opening day, there are not 30 number ones. So if you have a chance to access one of them, you, we'd be foolish not to at least check it out. Rick, there was an adjustment for Craig Kimbrell coming from the Cubs, the closer, to being a setup man. What did you see in Kimbrell that says, I need to have him on the ball club next year? Well, look, we're still evaluating all our options with Craig for next year. I'll tell you, he was tremendous in the clubhouse. He came in, obviously, you know, as an eight-time All-Star with Hall of Fame closer credentials. 
uh, as someone who was expressed wanting to put the team first and doing everything in his power to help us win a championship. Obviously, that move didn't work with regards to October of 2021. Uh, we did not, uh, it didn't help us convert on how we drew it up in terms of how he was going to fit towards uh, that ultimate goal of winning a championship. But from Craig, uh, we got some, we got leadership. We got a good presence in the clubhouse. There were times where we had to make some minor adjustments when his mechanics would stray a little bit from what allowed him to be successful. And we think he's going to continue to be a dominant reliever in, in 22. Uh, how he fits exactly, you know, we're going to have to spend the next few weeks and months figuring out precisely what's, what's the best use of him. In terms of using Everything that you have now at your disposal, looking back on this year, a year ago, everyone's like, you're hiring who is the manager? And then I heard Tim Anderson, I don't know, three or four weeks ago go, yeah, I really enjoyed playing for that guy. How would you evaluate the job Tony did? And did anything he do surprise you? I tell you, I, I think the one thing that was perhaps the, the most surprising was part of what endeared him to Tim Anderson, as you referenced, and other guys throughout that clubhouse. And that is that he walked in the door without uh, making clear you know, who he was or resting on his past accomplishments or his rings or his Hall of Fame credentials, and instead made it clear to everyone, front office, other coaches, players, support staff, that he was starting at zero and that he had to earn their trust and their respect. Uh, he didn't expect it to be given from him, to him. He expected it to be earned based on his knowledge and how he treated people. Uh, now that I know him better as a person, in retrospect, that shouldn't surprise me based on the kind of guy he is. But at the time, not knowing him great as a person, you know, you see the guy coming in with all he's accomplished. You know him from reputation from across the across the field in the opposing dugout. You know, kind of would have expected him to walk in potentially and, and mandate his way. But instead, he made it a priority to win the trust of his uh, players and staff and coworkers. And it really worked out well for him. Carlos Rodon is going to go elsewhere. And I'm wondering how you look at Carlos Rodon as a White Sox. What are your memories of him and, and why are the Sox moving on with him? Well, I, I, I cautious, uh, I'd caution you a little bit there on saying, you know, we're moving on and he's definitely going elsewhere. Keep in mind, uh, not exactly a year ago at this time, 11 months ago at this time, we non-tendered Carlos and, and he became a free agent, yet still later in the offseason, uh, he returned. So we're going to take a similar approach this year uh, and we'll remain in contact with him. I've already spoken with Scott Boris, his agent, last week and texted with Carlos over the weekend and we'll see we'll see how things unfold. Really, all the qualifying offer decision was about was uh, the fact that we know we're not going to have him back in the next 10 days at 18.4 million for one. And based on everything we know about the situation and our needs, we figured maintaining uh, the flexibility on our payroll and our ability to remain in contact with Carlos and other options uh, made a little more sense than potentially securing a, a draft pick as much as we would like that. Mm -hmm. That likely would have been somewhere in the seventies, uh, if the collective bargaining agreement does not change in this negotiation. So again, Carlos's days are not necessarily over. He's certainly going to explore his market and his, we will do the same with, with other options for the 22 club. But if in fact, this is the end of Carlos in a white Sox uniform, uh, I got to say, you got to give the kid a ton of credit for battling back year after year through the adversities he had physically. And we all got a chance to enjoy for a, a long stretch last year what he's capable of doing when he's hundred percent healthy and, and rested and able to, uh, you know, display his full talents. It, it was impressive. I know that Jerry wants desperately to get to the world series and win it again. I know he wants Jose Abreu to experience the joy of winning a championship here, but you can't just buy everything. You can't have a payroll. <laughs> hey, Jerry, the payroll's going to 300 million. It's just not the way it works. So do you see, a solution to second base in your system or right field already on your roster? Or do you truly believe, you know what? We've brought a lot through the system. I'm going to have to buy or acquire second base, right field, starting pitching, bullpen. And Rick has hung oh, up on you again. He hung up. It's the second interview in a row where you <laughs> ask a question and he hangs up. 
doesn't like the answer. This is the second time this has happened. <laughs> he he just does not like the questions that we ask on the show. We'll try to reestablish right, Rick we, we got him back. He, he's done this twice to us now. <laughs> he, 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 he just you just don't like our questions. That's fine. I mean, I, mean, I honestly think it's it's probably more to my answers go on so long that the battery dies. <laughs> like you ask two insightful <laughs> questions, and I just ramble and ramble and ramble, and boom, I'm out of juice. So there you, there you I, need go. A, I need a mofi or whatever they're called, and uh, then I can call you back. So <laughs> did, sorry about that. Did guys. you hear my question? You were asking him, yeah, you were asking about second base and right field and internal options, or do we need to go outside? Correct. Basically. Correct. Uh, I think we're probably closer to having internal answers in right field simply because we obviously still have Andrew Vaughn, Gavin Sheets, Adam Engel all on the roster, all of whom, uh, especially with the the first two we view as having continued growth and bright futures as they continue to get acclimated in the big leagues. At second base, we obviously have Danny Mendick and Romy Gonzalez as guys on the roster who are options for that spot. But maybe a little more, little certainly a little less established as big league producers than the right field options and guys that have some value in, in their ability to to move around the field as sort of super utility types on a championship club. So we yes, we do have some internal options for both. That said, we're certainly you know going to continue to vet the market for both second base and right field over the coming weeks, and whether that comes via free agency or trade, we'll. Just have to wait to see how these talks go over the next several months. We're not at spring training yet, Rick, but I would just I'd like to ask you, you mentioned Michael Kopech, the possibility of him being in the rotation. Do you expect him to be in the bullpen and the rotation back and forth or just as solidified as a number four or five guy? I think it's going to look more like, like the latter in that he's more of a true starter going every fifth day. Uh, over the course of the entire summer. That said, he's still a young starter. He's still a guy without a huge innings base. So there may be the occasion over the course of the summer where we're going to have to get a little creative, whether that's you know just throwing an inning or two out of the pen in between starts, uh, 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 excuse me, over skipping a start and over the course of the 10 days using him in the pen, or you know some other way to rest him throughout the course of the summer. But I think the, the best way to view him is as a traditional starter going forward in terms of defense both world series participants finished tied for first white Sox defensively were 27th without dramatically changing the roster to get better players in defensively by shifting more i know you guys were the one of the most effective teams when you shifted you didn't shift as much as many teams so my question is can you get better by utilizing the shift more, not having to tinker major additions to the roster, or no, I'm going to have to be better defensively? I think the simple answer is we're going to have to be better defensively. But again, with the shifts, I wouldn't look just at the gross number of shifts. You, you need to look at the number of outs that were converted into, or excuse me, hits that were converted into outs in another number of outs that were surrendered due to the shift. In other words, the net benefit of moving the players around. And I'm based on that number. Uh, again, this all comes from baseball info solutions. We were ninth in all of baseball in terms of effectiveness. Now that doesn't necessarily mean shift more because you obviously could surrender more hits by vacating the hole at short or moving a guy off a of second base uh, and there with additional shifts. And that would decrease the effectiveness that said, we obviously need to look at making sure we're at that sort of sweet spot of maximizing the number of outs saved or hits turned into outs from shifting. Uh, again, as I referenced on my media call last week, that also goes hand in hand with making sure our pitching attack, our game planning, is exploiting the guys who are shiftable properly. In other words, pitching them in a way that they will yield balls into the shift. If those two things aren't aligned, then you're going to wind up wasting those shifts. So it's a little more complicated than just the gross number of shifts and increasing it. Uh, but it's something that over the last three years, we've actually been in the top third in the league uh, each and every season in terms of the effectiveness of our shifting. Again, room for improvement, but not you know looking at it as 27th in the league. Cap, you and I are old baseball guys. You know, when a D, we have his DH, you want that guy in the corner smoking. He's got to be 38. He's been around and <laughs> seen everything. I want Rusty Staub. I want someone. Dick Allen. Yeah, Dick Allen. Something like that, right? So, and you don't have that on your roster. You don't have the old guys smoking in the corner uh, at, at guaranteed rate. 
Uh, is this going to be by committee, or do you have someone in mind you think that could be the everyday DH? Because more offense obviously is needed. You know, I would say let's wait to see how the offseason unfolds. It, it ties hand in hand to an extent with the right field solution. Uh, if we go out and sign an everyday right fielder, then you're looking at guys like potentially Vaughn and Sheets factoring into that DH spot. If we go more with a pure DH solution, then those two kids probably get pushed more into being part of the right field mix because we, we do think it's important not only uh, to the success of the 22 team, but beyond that, that we give those kids a chance to, to continue to grow as part of this. I had a GM over the weekend tell me, don't plan on going to the winter meetings. There's not going to be any winter <laughs> meetings. It's going to take time. Wait, what, hey, else, what else did Dallas Green tell you? He's deceased. <laughs> oh, uh, give me an example about how the new CBA could affect your planning for 22. Whether that be a rule change that, oh my God, that's going to change everything dramatically or player acquisition luxury. Is there something like that you think might happen? You know, I think we're, and for, the team team for the next month until the expiration of the current collective bargaining agreement, we're just proceeding business as usual. And we're assuming that, you know, fingers crossed that we're going to be able to continue the streak that the Players Association and MLB have been on since the mid 90s of being able to avoid work stoppages, which, you know, you'll remember obviously back in the early 90s, 80s, and 70s were a fairly frequent, uh, you know, pit stop for, for us over the course of the winters. Uh, in terms of what that new agreement may look like, at this point, frankly, you know as much as I do in terms of uh, what has been proposed and what the actual conversations are entailing. So for now, we continue under the current agreement, and if something changes, then we'll we'll adjust on the fly. We you know it's it's not going to be uh, anything we can't handle once negotiations are final. What did you see from the Atlanta Braves that you can apply to the team that you are running with the White Sox? Anything that stood out? You said, boy, they do that very well. Look, they were they were a fantastic team uh, in October. And, and uh, I remember my conversations with Alex, their general manager, and right leading up to the trade deadline where, you know, they were under 500. Uh, they obviously had a great deal, a great amount of injuries. And he was trying to figure out over the course of the you know two weeks after the draft leading up to the deadline, really what was the right moves to make? You know, are they given the injuries and the performance? Is it a sell situation, or should they you know buckle down and try to go for it? And to his credit, you know, he Alex and his staff believed in the fundamental uh, underlying talent of that group, and they decided to add, and they got hot at the right time. You know, I think it's it, it's a team that. Uh, over the course of the summer was under five under 500 against teams with winning records, which I know is a big thing for White Sox Twitter to, to harp about in terms of our performance at one point over the course of the summer. And they were a team that entered the postseason as the three seed in the National League. So I think they exemplified a, a few things. One, it's very important to get hot at the right time. Two, it's essential to get in because that's the only way, obviously, you're going to win is by getting in and getting shots on goal like they did. And third, you know, under the front office has a responsibility to understand the underlying talent of a team. And when given the opportunity to, to potentially make the postseason, ideally feed that talent and, and give them help. Rick, we really appreciate your time. We love talking baseball with you. I'm sure we'll bother you over the winter, but uh, good luck. I hope, I hope there's no labor stoppage and we are seeing you at spring training in February. Sounds good, guys. Be well. Appreciate your time. There he is, Rick Hahn, the executive VP and general manager of the Chicago White Sox. We'll